Well, thank you, Jim, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. For governments to start to make more sensible decisions about climate change and energy, they need to see an overwhelming public support for the realist position. The realist position is one that says, we don't know the future of climate change, so let's help people adapt today to what is undoubtedly mostly natural climate change. They call us climate deniers, but we're not. We're climate realists. So in my talk today, I'm going to actually focus on uh, the following things. And I press forward. You know, when we talk about an overwhelming majority of the public have to be shown to support climate realism, I'm not talking about 60%. I'm talking about 80% more. There is so much momentum in the climate scare. There's so many vested interests that want to keep it going. The government has to see that there is an overwhelming majority of public who don't actually support the climate scare. And so I'm going to cover the following things in today's article in an effort to show you how we can perhaps influence public opinion through the mainstream media. My first topic is concerning op-eds and letters. I'm not going to talk about radio and TV. John is far better at that than I am. But what I have found is that when you actually get published in mainstream media newspapers, radio interviews follow. Okay, So it's, it's a good starting place to get, get out there. Then I'll talk about the usual result of realist submissions to mainstream media. I'll talk about a good strategy that I've found almost by default. I actually looked back through my publications and said, why did this get published by a, a media source that is not right wing? And I've uncovered an interesting strategy that I think you'll like. And I'll talk about causes that trump the dangerous anthropogenic global warming belief in the minds of most mainstream editors. Now, we saw a poll that came out just uh, a few weeks ago, which was very encouraging. It was referenced a little earlier that 42% of Americans think that the climate scare is exaggerated. Okay, and this, you know, everybody feels excited about this, but as I say, you need 80% plus. Jay Lear was talking about this in last year's Las Vegas conference. You really can't, 51% uh, isn't going to do it. Now, while there are many ways to sway public opinion, probably, as I say, the most important is through mainstream media. According to a recent Gallup poll, about half of Americans felt that the media, mainstream media, was too liberal, and only about 19% felt that it was too conservative. Now, that really presents a problem for climate realists, because as you recall from my presentation last year, it's on the web if you want to look it up, um, Recent research has shown that people on the egalitarian communitarian side, it's a bit of a complex idea, it's discussed last year, that is the left wing, okay, people who call themselves progressives. They have far more concern about global warming impacts on people and the environment, human-caused global warming, than do people on the right. So this presents a real challenge for climate realists because environmentalists have been incredibly successful at convincing the public that environmentalism in general and stopping global global warming is a cause, a liberal cause, okay? It really, it really shouldn't be. I mean, it's science, you know? Science doesn't care whether it's left or right wing. But that is a big obstacle that we have to overcome. So because of their political orientation, many media accept the climate scare just by default, okay? They may not know much about it, but it's part of the laundry list of ideals that progressives hold dear. So let's have a look at some of the other ideals that they hold dear and if we can take advantage of some of these to help get our message out. They say, in some cases, they actually do support social justice, protection of wildlife and the environment, tolerance of alternative lifestyles and opinion, rejection of authority and absolutism, re rejection of superstition. So if we can show that some of these causes, perhaps for a particular editor, they're more interested in social justice or they're more interested in the protection of eagles, okay, which are being massacred in Ontario by wind turbines. Um, if we can show them that one of the causes that they hold more dear than the climate scare, then we get their attention. We have to give them an incentive to open our email and to actually read our article. Because the bottom line is you can write the best article on the planet if the editors are mostly deleting them, which in my opinion they are, then you're not going to get anything. So let's start out with a sample of what I've found happens when you submit letters to the editor or op-eds to mainstream media. So we'll start with, let's say, 100 submissions. Now people think, oh my god, who's going to make 100 submissions? Well, I'll tell you, you have to do it, okay? Except for newspapers that actually say exclusive to us, period. You have to be suspicious about that because some of them will then never publish, meaning your piece never gets published. So they can actually act as a closed gatekeeper by promising to publish and then not do so. And so really a better approach is to submit to many newspapers, um, and as I say, 
a hundred is, is really not too many. There are plenty, okay? As long as you don't, uh, as long as their circulation areas don't overlap. That's the big key. You have to make sure their circulation areas don't overlap or you're going to have a lot of angry editors. <laughs> now, right away, half of the submissions are deleted based on name recognition as to who sent it, okay? <laughs> Many people, I'm sure in this audience, sending a letter to the editor or an op-ed, the editor doesn't open it. Delete, and there's nothing you can do about that, okay? Except for taking some sort of pseudonym or something. But so you really can't do much about those people. The subject, well, you can choose subject titles that might make reference to one of the other causes they hold dear, and that might encourage them. We've got another chunk who open the email. They might start to read your letter to the editor, and they say, ah, another denier, delete. You still haven't got them to read yet, okay? So your arguments don't matter yet. Um, some of them actually start to read your article, okay? And if you start out with, Al Gore's an idiot, delete. <laughs> Okay, so these, I mean, you have to remember, these are progressives, he's their hero. You can't approach it that way. It doesn't matter how good your arguments are, they're not going to read you. Ah, this is a group of people who actually read your whole piece. And you see, we're right down to about, oh, maybe 15% of all the submissions. Most of those will delete it. They have limited space, they may not agree with your conclusions. The final analysis is that only about 1% will actually read your whole piece and accept it. And I find that's quite typical. If you're submitting to many newspapers, 100, you go for 200, maybe you get two publishings, okay? But you, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to increase this percentage. Unless you're a complete slave, and as Jim was saying, sometimes I am working till 2, 3 in the morning, I got a great piece, you know, I send it out to 200 newspapers, making sure they all don't overlap. That's a whole day's job. Okay, so we want to increase this 1%, so we don't have to be, as, as my Arab friends would say, doing total donkey work, you know, sending it everywhere in the universe and hoping somebody please picks it up. So we're trying to incre increase this 1% to something that is more reasonable. So let's look at causes related to the climate scare that progressives would generally feel concerned about. First of all, a lack of money for adaptation. Biofuels impact on the poor, lack of electricity for the poor in Africa, and the thing I'm going to speak most about today is industrial wind turbines, okay, because there's a lot of impact that even left-wingers do not like. Now, the adaptation to mitigation thing is interesting. According to the Climate Policy Initiative in San Francisco, they found that roughly $1 billion a day is being spent on climate finance around the world. Now, the UN wanted to see that split 50-50 between adaptation and mitigation. But guess what? Adaptation, helping real people today adopt or adapt to climate change, whatever the cause, gets a total of 6%, okay? 94% of that money is spent, as you can see on this chart, 94%, that whole big top uh, square, is being spent on mitigation. Now, for many editors, what they see, if you show them this and you talk about it in your piece, is you're effectively giving more value to the lives of people who haven't even been born yet than people who are suffering today. And any time there's a world disaster like in Nepal or other places, they say, oh, we don't have enough money. Well, of course you do. You have, you have almost a billion dollars a day being spent on what might happen to climate in 50 years. Okay, so even left-wingers are starting to say, does that make any sense, you know? And, and so what you do is you, it, it's not like I'm trying to trick them, okay, because this is a valid concern. I, when I was talking to the Ethiopians in Copenhagen at the COP, uh, COP night, what was it, COP, COP 15, uh, they would point to the screen and they'd say, those protesters are crazy. They're all out, out there protesting what might happen in 50 years. My people need help today. And that is a legitimate cause that shouldn't be left or right wing, okay? And you can bring editors in. I've had a lot of letters to the editor published by starting out with that obvious problem. Biofuels is a very serious issue. You can see here that about 6.5% of the world's grain um, is, is being taken out of the world food supply, okay? So this is terrible for, uh, you know, poor people in, in much of the world. Again, this is also happening in places like Malaysia and... and um, and Indonesia, where 90% of all the palm oil plantations are, okay? That's where most of the palm oil comes from, which is used in biodiesel. 
So what they're doing is they're turning, you know, tropical forest into mono, monoculture plantations. And there was a group actually that put out a letter, and this was a left-wing group, okay, from developing countries, uh, 197 civil societies, civil uh, society organizations, they signed the letter and it said the following. The destruction of forests and fertile agriculture to make way for palm oil plantations is jeopardizing the food sovereignty and cultural integrity of entire communities uh, who depend on it for their source of food and livelihood. So they're ruining the biodiversity. They're pushing poor people off their land. Okay, how is that a social justice? I mean, obviously that's a social justice issue. And so if you can show them, ah, this is the consequences of a belief that mitigation should get all the money, this is a good thing to bring up. Steve Gorham published a really excellent book. You can see the title here. And he talks about another injustice caused by the climate scare. It turns out that uh, the World Bank, when they were looking at approving the Mindupi power plant, and you can see that this is a piece of coal, a coal-fired coal power plant, um, what we find, first of all, I'll just mention that 41% of the world's electricity is still coal, okay? Uh, the Americans, a little bit less, China, 81%, India, 71%. So coal is the most important source of electricity across the world. And of course, it can be made very clean. And I'm not talking about CO2, I'm talking about pollution. So this is the most important source of electricity right now in the world. And yet, when South Africa wanted to get money to build this power plant, the Mindupi power plant, they went to the World Bank. And it was the United States and European countries that voted against giving them the money, okay? Against giving them the money to build a power plant, to pull their people out of poverty because of their concerns about climate change, okay? So it is really interfering. The only reason why this power plant did get the money to build, and it's under construction now, is because developing countries overruled them in the World Bank, okay? So this is something that left-wingers should be really quite concerned about. Basically, developed countries are saying that poor people should develop their countries with power sources that we in the West cannot really even afford to use on a large scale, things like wind and solar power, okay? Africa has all these fossil fuel sources too. But we're saying they have to develop with wind and solar. I mean, how silly. In the United States, of course, very clean electricity supply in comparison with most of the world. Your coal centers are very clean. But if Obama wins in his war on coal, it's the poor that will suffer. And Paul Dreisen points this out many times, OK? So that's another argument to bring out. The last thing I'm going to talk about is in Ontario, where they're building believe it or not, 61 story high <laughs> wind turbines. And it's all part of the Ontario government's green climate plan or green, um, green energy plan, they call it. They want to lead the world in stopping climate change, okay? And so as a consequence, they're building these 610 story high turbines. Um, and, and of course, it's, it's causing electricity rates to skyrocket. People in the United States should really watch what's happened in Ontario if you want a warning of what not to do. In 2003, we got 25% of our electricity, <coughs> excuse me, we got 25% of our electricity from coal. We had low rates, we were a leader, we were a powerhouse in Canada, we provided money to the central pot that's then shared across the country. We were a have province, okay? Now we get 0% of our energy from coal because we are going to stop climate change. Oh yeah. And now we have, we, we now have a debt per capita five times that of California, okay? We are now a have-not province. We receive money from Alberta and Saskatchewan. We don't contribute to the Canadian overall economic well-being. And of course, this causes massive increases in electricity prices, and the big impact is on the poor. Again, a cause that liberals should care about. And in fact, the, these wind turbines are, have even attracted the attention of a group called Save the Eagles International out of Spain. And they're very smart. They know how to create headlines, okay? And here's the headline they have in their news release that came out on May 23rd. Okay, now that's going to grab most progressive, most people are going to look at that and say, what, that's an endangered species, you're going to slaughter them in Ontario? Well, that's exactly what they're going to do because they're building them all along the north of the lake, okay, which is a migrating area for, for these eagles. And so that's actually a cause that we have to really focus on. And if you look at it closely, what you're going to see is we will become the graveyard of millions of birds and bats because we're trying to stop climate change. Okay, so start an article with that. You get the attention of the editor. They read your piece. Use that in your subject line. Okay, that's the way to get attention. Now, 
as we were driving along the highway just north of a wind farm near Chateauguay, New York State, I took some pictures. And I, I have these here because it's really hard to believe how close these are to homes. These are 37-story high wind turbines, okay? They're a little more than half as big as what we're putting up in Ontario. But we're gonna see in a second, uh, the impact on the community is amazing. I mean, look at this, they're like, they look like they're right next door. And in fact, I'm just gonna give you a little slide here which is sort of fun. These are my daughters, they, my, one of them is, uh, she's an environmentalist, she says, stop wind turbines, they're killing all the birds, you know, which is what we want. Okay, we want the environmentalists and the, and the progressive editors to say these are bird blenders. So they said, well, they don't look very far away, of course, they didn't know they were 37 stories high. So we're going to run to the base of the turbine. <laughs> well, here, is, here they are, five minutes after starting the run. They got halfway there, and they gave up. And these turbines are small by comparison with what's going up in Ontario. Put to scale, this is what's going up in Ontario. Now, this is of particular concern for a lady by the name of Shelley Correa. Okay? Shelley Correa, here you can see her pictured with her son. Um, they have really serious concern because they moved to Lincoln County because her son had very serious um, problems here. And I'll just get the exact title so that I know exactly what the problem was. Okay, he has a disease called sensory processing disorder. And it's critical that he live in environments that are free from excessive noise. So they moved to this beautiful area West Lincoln, Ontario, okay? I mean, it's like Mayberry. You couldn't pick a quieter place. But because of the, the fight to stop climate change, the Ontario government has announced that they're going to put up 61-story wind turbines, the biggest in North America, one of which is going to be 550 meters from her house, okay? <laughs> now, let's look at what she said. She actually, has, she's fought this really hard. She's got enormous courage, uh, Ms. Correa. And uh, Joey's helping her out too, which is great. But he, she said this to the Environmental Review Tribunal. On top of the incessant cyclical noise, there is light flicker and infrasound. This is not something that my son will be able to tolerate. And let's take a look at what her science advisor said, because she has someone working with her who's a very good uh, person in understanding the statistics of damage to children. Um, Carmen Croft says, vigilance and long-term surveillance systems regarding risks and adverse effects related to children are lacking. This evaluation should take place before proceeding with additional approvals. Oh, but we've got to stop climate change. So as Shelley said to the tribunal, the common theme being that no one can help us because of the Green Energy Act. Okay? So really bad things are happening in Ontario and all over the world in the effort to mitigate climate change. Okay, they are saying, in every one of these cases, they are saying the lives of people today, and that's Joey in the forefront holding his sign, the lives and health and welfare of people today is less important than the possible discomfort of people in 50 years. Okay, now even left-wingers have a little bit of a trouble with that. Okay. Now, traditionally, skepticism is usually seen as something that is practiced on the left of the political spectrum people who disdain absolute statements from powerful authorities. So we need to give them a reason to want the climate scare to be wrong. We want them to not tell us the truth. We want them to be skeptics, which of course is what left wing was all about. When Einstein announced his theory of relativity, it was the German left that supported him. It was the conservatives who didn't like it because it threatened their worldview. We want to encourage the left to do what they would do naturally, be skeptics. So what we want to do is we want to reference near the beginning of our articles and our letters to the editor some cause, some issue issue that is really damaged as a result of the focus on climate mitigation. And I'll tell you, I, didn't, I was doing this subconsciously. When I was writing this speech, I thought, oh, let's look through my list of media hits and see, is there a correlation? I mean, I'm saying there is. Well, there sure was. And I won't name the newspapers because, of course, our opponents would send to their editors right away, Harris is using this trick to get you published. It's not a trick. It's basic psychology. It's telling them things that they are concerned about so they have an incentive to open your email, to read through it. And then by the end, they get to the point where they say, gee, I really wish that we didn't have to have wind turbines. I really wish we didn't have to have biofuels because look at these things that I value more that are suffering as a consequence. So that's my speech. Thank you very much.